Hello and welcome to episode number 29 of the Media Meets podcast where we speak to a wide range of people from the music world. On the show this time we have chiptune legend Nullsleep who's been uh, one of the forefathers of the chiptune uh, scene really making music on Nintendo Game Boy, uh, NES and loads of other consoles and computers. Uh, he's been absolutely instrumental in that scene uh, and was behind a website and digital label called 8-Bit Peoples, uh, where people could upload their music and their chip tunes and also share the sound file of their music. There is now a GoFundMe page for the podcast. There is also a Ko-fi page if you want to donate to it. Um, all donations will just go back into the running of the show and will be greatly appreciated. Okay, so let's get into the show. Uh, the first question I asked Null Sleep was about his musical beginnings. Yeah, um, I mean, there's, yeah, I guess the, the, the one that, like, um, sticks out to me first is um, the first kind of music that I started getting interested in was, like, probably when I was, like, around, like, I would say eight or nine years old. I uh, I was really into um like classic cars um like old corvettes and and things like that um sort of from the 50s and um and 60s and uh it felt like that kind of naturally um dovetailed even for like for a kid back then like with the music of that time so i i got really into like classic rock um sort of oldies stuff um and like had like uh, my parents like buy me some cassettes of that stuff and I would just listen to them over and over, um, which is really funny uh, compared to like where I've ended up. Um, but uh, but yeah, that was kind of like my early stuff. And then as I think as I grew up into like a teenager and entered my teen years, then I started um, getting into a lot of the same stuff that I still listen to now um, and sort of broadening my horizons and um it was, I think that turning point for me was, um, kind of around this time, like in between, you know, when I was listening to that sort of like classic rock oldies stuff, and then, uh, the sort of a lot of electronic music that I ended up getting into, uh, I remember seeing a movie, um, called Electric Dreams, um, and the, the, it was, it's a really, uh, strange movie but like actually i i rewatched it like fairly recently within the last couple of years and kind of mm -hmm. still still holds up in a way i don't know if you've ever seen it but it's like um it's kind of a uh, i guess the easiest way to sum it up is like it's a it's a story of like a love tri triangle between like uh, a girl a guy and the guy's computer that like has an <laughs> ai in it but this is like from wow. the 80s so it was like kind of a little bit uh, prescient in terms of like, you know, seeing where where things are going now. Um, also, the aesthetic of it was like very much like felt like an like an extended feature length Apple commercial from like that same era. Um, wow. So it had some good. cool stuff. But the, the soundtrack was um, was also great. There were uh, Giorgio Moroder did a bunch of tracks on the soundtrack and. Um, uh, including a, a collaboration with Phil Oakey from Human League um, and Jeff Lynn of ELO also had some tracks on there. So it was like a lot of really cool um, electronic music, synth pop stuff uh, that kind of captured my attention. There was a um, like a classical music um, rendition uh, by Giorgio Moroder on the soundtrack where there was like the 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 female uh, the woman in the in the movie who was the love interest played the cello she was like a cellist in in the movie and there's a scene when she's playing the cello and then the computer like hears her through the wall and starts playing along to to the cello piece that she's playing and there's wow. like this weird duet with like an electronic like a very lo-fi beepy electronic music version of this and the funny thing is that kind of was what that was the first time I remember like being like, I want to make music, but I didn't, I didn't actually gravitate at the time towards the, the computer side of it. I actually was like, I want to learn cello. So I ended up, <laughs> I ended up getting, um, my parents to, um, 
uh, get me cello lessons. And I uh, like this could have gone very differently, but I studied cello for one summer and I was like, this sucks. I'm terrible at it. It's so hard. Like my, you know, I'm torturing everyone in my home with these sounds. And so I ended up, uh, you know, quitting fairly quickly. Um, but, you know, that was probably, I think that was still while I was in elementary school. But then as time went on, I got more into electric, listening to electronic music. Um, I had a couple of friends in high school, uh, my friends Dave and Luke, who the three of us like were always sort of sharing recommendations around that time, listening to a lot of um, good stuff and sort of hitting hitting the mall and going and picking up CDs together and things like that. And I uh, found a lot of like the early stuff um, that I, that I am, you know, some of that is, I'm still into early Prodigy stuff, um, Chemical Brothers, like the big beat stuff was really huge around that time. You know, I, I, I feel like there's, there's a thing with like big beat erasure right now, like where it's like big beat isn't, wasn't cool. Like everyone wants to forget about it, but at the time everyone loved it. Like if we're going to be honest, like fat boy slim, yeah. you know, uh, the, those chemical brothers records, the crystal method, um, propeller heads. Uh, yeah. So all of, yeah, all of these <laughs> definitely all of that huge. stuff. And, uh, and then like thing, uh, you know, people, uh, Groups like Orbital were huge. Orbital, the Orb, um, and you know some. I mean, I I could I could go on, but uh, a lot of that stuff um, sort of started coming into the picture, and then hanging out on in AOL chat rooms and talking to other people into this stuff. Um, got a little bit into um, industrial, also like with Nine Inch Nails and Skinny Puppy and KMFDM, um, and. Uh, and then like through sort of like listening to this stuff a lot and hanging out with people, um, both like in real life and, and online who were into it, got, um, started meeting some people online, especially who were then starting to try to make their own music. And like, it was either using trackers like mod plug or, um, or fruity loops, of course. Um, and so, uh, so when I um, graduated from from high school and left to go to college, that was kind of when I started. Um, I had access to a high speed university network. I started pirating audio software, and that's kind of when when I started r first writing music. Fantastic! Wow, that first of all, well, yeah, first of all, that film sounds incredible. I did read on. I did read on a page somewhere about you being influenced by it, and yeah. I was like, "Oh, this sounds good." I didn't. I didn't. I mean, it sounds amazing when you explain it that there's that three-way <laughs> love triangle. It reminds me of that film with um, uh, Joaquin Phoenix, yeah, that, she, where he uh, falls she, in love uh, with his, she or her, her, her. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, straight away it reminds me of that. But obviously, being in the eighties, it's probably got it's, like, like you say, that aesthetic, like totally. The, the styling, um, it must have seemed so futuristic then. Yeah, when um, I when I, 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 when I saw it. when I saw her, actually, the first thing I thought of was like, oh, this is just like kind of an updated modern day version of Electric Dreams. Like it was kind of it had right. that kind of I mean, there's obviously like differences in like where the narrative goes, but like there is definitely a similarity to it. Wow, yeah, yeah, yeah. And and obviously all of those bands that you mentioned that were influential is like, I mean, that's literally all the stuff I grew up with, yeah. uh, the records that I bought when I was a kid. And yeah, it is funny that that sort of breaks big beat scene just sort of disappeared. It was yeah. quite strange the way that, that yeah. But I, I always think the break the breaks are going to come back. I've just got this really oh, yeah. weird nostalgia thing that's like, I love that genre. I love the nights of that, of, of going to those uh, sorts of nights. Um, yeah, Crystal Method were huge, you know. Yeah. Like they were the, you know, incredible. I, I remember I've got some really old records of theirs. Um, also, uh, Future Sound of London were oh, another one. Oh, yeah, that's, I, th I, definitely, I definitely forgot to mention them. They're, they were huge for me. I mean, Accelerator is still one of the albums that, like, I feel like it, I got it, it, was in heavy rotation when I first got it and it like has almost never left heavy rotation. Like I still listen to it a lot, um, today and, um, yeah, it's just a classic. 
Yeah, their music. There's something about the future sound of London that I, I there is different f- for me personally than 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 all of the others. That it always sounds current. It always yeah. sounds like they could have made it yesterday. Yeah, you know, like it really. What they did have the future. I mean, they're called the future sound of London. <laughs> Like they're really, yeah, so they, they, they lived were. up to it, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, pretty pretty ballsy move to, to do that, but, you know, it worked out for them. Yeah, you couldn't call yourself that and just sound like some fucking generic shit that yeah. some mm-hmm. dude's someone's making i feel like um but wasn't was isdn was that one of their album titles or was that another alias but that didn't age as well i'm like (laughs) isdn very futuristic at the time not not so futuristic anymore yeah like the tech yeah i guess the um yeah the technology of it um but yeah some amazing records yeah amazing amazing records yeah and um yeah you mentioned trackers there trackers are sort of a a slightly alternative sort of DAW to what we have now. Although we do have Reason now, uh, Renoise now, which yep. is like a modern updated tracker, updated yeah. modern tracker. Yeah. What were those early experiments with making music like for you? Yeah. So I, I mean, it ranged from um, before I really got into like audio software. Um, I was doing I was doing stuff um, when I was still in high school um, with. Uh, with like Q basic, um, you know, quick basic running in, in, uh, on a, a PC and, um, learning how to program music in Q basic and making some like, sort of like primitive games in there with, um, with my younger brother. And, uh, and then as I, uh, as I got, um, you know, to college and started, like I said, started having access to high speed internet and being able to get on IRC and sort of like see, who had like pirated software that I could use to make music. Um, and I had like some direction from, uh, my, my friend who at the time I had only met online, um, Mike Hanlon, who was the guy who, um, you know, we would go on to, uh, found 8-Bit Peoples together. Um, uh, he was, he was living in Detroit at the time. He was, he had sort of been working on his own music for, I think a couple years at that point. And he, you know, was telling me what he was using. So I would go online and look for those uh, pieces of software. But I, yeah, in the early days, like the the two that I played with a lot were, um, were Modplug, Tracker and Fruity Loops. Um, Modplug, I, uh, I liked the Tracker interface, but I like didn't really, I wasn't really good at working with samples at the time. I was more interested in, in synthesizing sounds. And so I ended up, um, early on gravitating toward uh, Fruity Loops and just sort of using the built-in synthesizers that were in there um, to make some of the first stuff that I that I put out on 8-Bit Peoples, which was uh, obviously horrible. You know, the first music you make is like, you know, when you get to a point where you're like, you're like, you know, you're working on music, it's hard, it's bad. Also, I had I had pretty much no musical training except for that one summer of cello lessons. And so I didn't really understand how to write melodies or how to write, um, uh, you know, beats or anything. I just kind of learned it all through trial and error. And But you get to a certain point when things start sounding good to you at least and you're not you're like, okay, this is cool, yeah, wow, okay. And then you put it out and then, you know, later on, like, you're like, oh wow, that's that was really terrible. But it, you know, you have to you have to <laughs> crawl before you walk. Um, and Definitely. and so yeah, so I I um I started putting out some of that stuff, and then I guess it was uh, probably like that was so that would be in like '99 um, was when I started at college, and I think like uh, you know by the end of that year or the early in 2000, I had put out like, um, some of like the, the first sort of experiments that I was doing with music, um, just up on mp3.com. And then, you know, basically I think the first 8-Bit People's website, um, probably just like linked out to like our mp3.com pages for people to download and listen to stuff from. And that website itself was running on a server sitting on the desktop in my dorm room, and, you know, that was like, you could I just set up a web server in your dorm room and that's that's your web page now. Um, and then mm. I think in, in 2000 is when I got, um, I sort of started, you know, the, the music that I was writing at that time was kind of, um, 
intentionally emulating like the aesthetics of, uh, of sort of low, low tech, like low bit, um, computer games. Um, and I, uh, that sort of like led me to hearing about LSDJ and Nano Loop. Um, and I got copies of, of those trackers. And so those are both trackers for the original Nintendo Game Boy, or sorry, LSDJ is a tracker for the Game Boy and Nano Loop is kind of, uh, has its own very unique um, approach to, to composition. That's um, that's also very interesting, but is 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 quite different. Um, but I yeah, it's also multi-platform. Yeah, it? In yeah. Nanoloop. You can get it like worked for the game. Yeah, Advance, there's a few different the there's a few different versions of Nano Loop, and there's even like I think iOS and Android versions of it at this point. Um, but I played with those a bit, and it was cool to be using. Um, a Game Boy to produce this music because it was like now instead of uh, instead of like intentionally imposing sort of limitations to emulate that kind of sound, you had a piece of hardware that was um, that was imposing those limitations because they were inherent to the the technical limitations of that of that platform. And so uh, I, I I tended I gravitated towards LSDJ as the one that sort of I clicked with more. It was cool because it was the tracker interface that I liked about ModPlug, but it was synthesis instead of sample based um, for the most part. There's one channel on the Game Boy that you can use um, samples on, but the other two are, um, you know, square waves with variable uh, duty cycles and then a white noise generator. And I liked the ability to sort of go in and be able to tweak those parameters and, and shape the sounds that I wanted to use in the songs. And so that was kind of where... Uh, in 2000, 2001, that was like when my like current trajectory of like chip music began. I guess first of all the power of the Nintendo Game Boy is that you could play video games anywhere yep. and the fact that it had like LSDJ is a cartridge for the Game Boy you could sit on the train and exactly make music. yeah you could go to the woods and make music yeah you could just you're not limited you don't have to plug anything in or yeah that must have been quite cool to just go out and yeah it was I mean tunes. it was huge it was that the portability factor was was awesome and then also just like the um the like cost of a Game Boy, like a used Game Boy at that time was like, you could get one for pretty much nothing. Cause it was, uh, you know, at that time it was what, like 10, at least 10 years old, maybe, maybe more. Um, and, uh, so you could find ones, you know, find them secondhand. I think the first one that I started writing music with might've been the, the one that I originally had as a kid. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it was it was cheap. It was easy. It sounded cool. It sounded different. Um, and uh, and I don't know. I just remember. Yeah, I remember being around campus, sitting outside, you know, on the lawn, and with a pair of headphones and a Game Boy, and just like working on tracks. And um, and then yeah, eventually getting getting comfortable. And then and uh, uh, I think it was in two thousand one. I played my first show my first live show where I was just basically, it was me on stage with the Game Boy. Um, I think I had uh, an old Sony Vio laptop um, that I also played maybe some of the Fruity Loops tracks off of. Um, but I played, yeah, I played some, some Game Boy tracks um, at a club, like in, I think it was like, trying to remember, I don't even remember if it was in Brooklyn or Manhattan, but um, it was alongside a, a, another guy named Minus Baby. Um, who has also put out some releases on 8-Bit Peoples, and it was his first gig also. And he, remember, he brought his whole desktop computer to the show along with, like, a big old CRT, CRT. monitor. No. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it was, I mean, it was, and oh, and there were, like, li and like there were literally, like, five people at the show. It was, like, my girlfriend at the time um, and uh, Minus Baby's brother, Tim, and then, like, I think a couple other friends and... Um, but a, a, a funny detail that I also remember is that um, 
I don't know if you know about the artist Corey Archangel. He's uh, he's done some really interesting art pieces. He's also he uh, was part of a collective called Beige, and they put out this um, vinyl called the Eight Bit Construction Set. Um, and one one side of it was Atari tracks and Atari locked grooves, and the other was C sixty four C C sixty four track and C sixty four locked grooves and. Um, he was actually the guy who did visuals uh, for for that show. So it was, wow. and we ended up, uh, you know, being uh, becoming friends. And he helped me um, at some point, uh, you know, a couple years later to uh, as I started working on music for the Nintendo Entertainment System. Um, he had worked on some um, art projects around hacking NES games and desoldering the ROM chips and reprogramming EPROMs and things like that. And uh, I ended up getting a little bit of help from him in terms of figuring out how to get um, my NES music running on the actual uh, cartridges and the, and the actual hardware. Cool, man. Yeah, because there's there are quite a few mods for the Game Boy, aren't there? There's like the mm. Pro Sound mod that you can do. Um, obviously, it's quite handy to backlit your screen so you can yep. see it in the dark. Um, we all try and play the Game Boy like at a weird angle so you get yeah. the light on the screen. But once you have it back, it's, it's much yeah. easier. Yeah, and you, I mean, you needed to have, yeah, you needed to have some kind of um, way of lighting the screen if you were going to start taking it out and playing it in clubs and things like that. Um, definitely, definitely, definitely. So it was, uh, yeah, it was, I remember at the time those, you know, those backlight solutions, I think, came around probably in large part because of the chip music scene and and the interest in making Game Boy music. Um, but at the time, uh, you know, the only solutions were like the clamp on like big magnifying glass with like the lights that were <laughs> built into it that ran on its own like AA batteries. And then I think there was another one that maybe you could like plug into the... Um, the like link port and it was like kind of like on a little bendy oh, yeah. thing yeah I and that, so like an led i think i had one of yeah, those yeah so i think they, in, the, in the very early days i think those were those were the solutions we were using to to see our screens you know when we were out at these out of these clubs playing game boy music yeah, there there is um there's a really funny British YouTuber, a guy called Ashens, <clears throat> and he reviews generally he just reviews shit consumer products that are like yeah. rip offs of rip offs of consoles that are like ten dollars PlayStation yep. five, you know, just, yeah, yeah, just yeah, yeah. rubbish <laughs> and toys that are rubbish. But he he does occasionally do like video game stuff and he's done a video where he's he's going through all of those add on things for the Game Boy that you could buy and all of these monstrosities with like two joysticks. Oh, yeah. you know, a I giant these, yeah. like speakers that fold out, yep. you know, it's like a transformer yeah, yeah. thing that's just but like the beauty of the Game Boy is that it's portable and that it's small and then you've got to take around totally. this big fuck off piece of plastic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there were, I mean, but that's, I mean, isn't, isn't that always the way, we, like, even still, like, it's like people love to, you know, companies love to put out accessories, and then it, by the time you over-accessorize this piece of gear, you've, like, taken away all of the original value that that piece of gear <laughs> <Yeah>. had. <laughs> Definitely, definitely. Um, yeah, you've mentioned um, 8-Bit Peoples a few times, and um, yeah. yeah, it'd be really interesting to talk about that. Um you set that up in around when you did you set that up when you were in college? Yeah, so that was like right at it was basically like within a couple months of um, getting to college and uh, as a freshman. So it was uh, I think October of nineteen ninety nine um, was when we like officially like put up like the first eight bit people's website. Nice, but yeah, yeah, it was. Um, I mean, I'm I'm happy to go into a little bit of that history and and talk about it. Yeah, I mean, uh, for people that don't know, maybe it's 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 a digital uh, r- label for yeah. for music. Um, yeah. What was the ethos behind it? What was the idea when you, when you started? Yeah. Uh, so I mean, I think that in the beginning it was it was pretty loose. It was just kind of uh, me and Mike um, talking about uh, you know. Uh, what if we, you know, what if we just like made a little like essentially what was like a fake label, you know, because like we're, we, you know, we're two guys that had just started making music. We're not going to like get signed to a label We're we're going to make our own and we're going to put it out there and do some branding around it and see what happens. And um, 
And I think that, uh, you know, uh, at that time, this was this became like a reality because of the Internet and the, and the web and the fact that, like, you could just like do something like that. You could make, you know, make up a name for something, make a logo, make a website. And then suddenly, oh, you have a you have a label. You're you know, you're on 8-Bit Peoples. OK. Um, and that was, you know, that that kind of came to be known as like a net label. Um, you know, there were there. Were, and then in the in the subsequent years, there were a lot of net labels that were founded and primarily releasing music through um, through the Internet as like MP3 MP3s or um, or, you know, even in, in native tracker formats like XMs and ITs and mods. <clears throat> um and uh and yeah so in those early days they i think they the ethos was essentially like let's just put out music um the name obviously sort of alluded to like the aesthetic leanings um that we had at the time and uh and th then definitely over the years came to um sort of almost dictate the ethos more than the other way around so we picked the name 8-bit peoples and then that kind of like shaped in a lot of ways i think what the what the label would um would go on to to become um and you know we uh we started with the you know the two of us and then a couple and then mike knew a couple other people who were doing thing inter interesting things musically at the time um, Yupster was one of the early artists, um, Ten and Tracer, um, and, uh, and we started, yeah, we started just kind of like gathering a little collective amongst ourselves and putting out some tunes and, um, and then, you know, it ran for a long time. Technically it's, it's still running. It's, it, we haven't been very active in putting out releases for the past few years, at least now. Um, but, uh, every once in a while, something, something new comes out and all of the old, um, you know, back catalog and discography are still available, uh, for download. Um, but yeah, it became, I think, you know, it it changed over time from being that very loose like we just want to release some music to being geared towards okay how uh, how far can we push like the technical technical limitations of um, this like old consumer electronics hardware early video game consoles and it also became a, about um, sort of subverting the intended uses or like the marketed commercial uses of those pieces of hardware so. You know the Game Boy. You 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 think of the Game Boy. You think of video games. It's a video game console. But like that's uh, that identity to the Game Boy is a, a marketing identity. That's how the Game Boy was marketed. It was marketed as a video game device. But at the end of the day, what the Game Boy is is uh, a you know a, a low powered computer. Um, with a uh, with an, an interface of a directional pad and four buttons um, and um, a video output uh, a low you know a low resolution video output and a uh, audio output and so once you start thinking about it in that way um, you open it up to uh, the the capabilities of any computer which is to run software and the software that we chose to run, run on the Game Boy was LSDJ, or, uh, you know, written by Johan Kotlinski or, um, or Nanoloop written by Oliver Vitkov. And, um, and then it just became about seeing how far you could push this computer in terms of like the music it could produce. Um, and then that sort of extended and applied to other, um, other pieces of hardware as well. Things like the C64, um, I mean, Go280 uh, is a huge na name in the chip music scene um, in terms of C64 music has been active for a very long time. We've put out some of Go280's releases on 8-Bit Peoples and um, NES music as well. Vert, Jake, Jake Kaufman, um, we've released some of his um, NES um, stuff as well. And uh, yeah, it was just, it. I think that, I think that that's kind of what, um, what sort of started driving um, 8 bit peoples philosophically was that idea of uh, taking taking back and reclaiming um, you know consumer electronics that were marketed to us in one way but we wanted to use them in another way and also trying to sort of push them as far as they can go and and uh, sort of reacting a little bit against the 
um, the sort of like uh, overproduction um, approach at the time to music and being like, well, what if we just like write music on like this cheap piece of plastic and uh, record it in, you know, our bedrooms and then just encode MP3s and put it out on the internet and see what happens. Yeah, it's a really, really great um, mindset to have, um, especially, yeah, subverting the sort of the way that it was marketed. Uh, I guess also it's also um, I really admire it because it's like um, a lot of consumer products have like planned obsolescence, don't they? Like they plan like this product is old. It's now worthless Buy the new one. And in a scene like, um, yeah, and like what you're doing is um, it's really uh, like cherishing those those things that were released knowing that they still have value they can still do incredible things and um yeah like less is more in in totally yeah, yeah. In a lot of it yeah that's um yeah it's a really 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 cool thing like i i i certainly look at a game boy and just straight away think chip tunes i don't really think video mm-hmm. games anymore when i look at one <laughs> yeah i mean that's pretty cool like if we if we've sort of like managed to hit a tipping point and like uh, on a cultural level and and pushed it over from like being seen as one thing to being seen as this other thing that we we made it into yeah i mean i've got a commodore 64 over there and i've only i've never played a game on it i've only ever used it for music mm-hmm. software so it's i feel like i'm definitely missing out on what it's really intended for but at the yeah. same time <laughs> yeah. it's like i just plug a cartridge in and i can make music so like that's that's the fun part yeah, uh, uh, yeah, and I mean, and that 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 computer, I mean, and it's such an amazing sound chip, yeah. the SID chip in the Commodore sixty four, um, so you know, beefy. a weird hybrid of digital and analog within a chip, and um, yeah, the the kind of music that came out of um, the C sixty four scene uh, was, you know, has always been impressive, and people continued to to do amazing things with it. Um, there's a guy uh, based in the UK um, uh, who produces under the name Jellica, and his stuff is is great. It's very very unique, uh, very um, sort of like uh, I don't even know how to describe it. No, it. Doesn't follow any of the trends that you that you find in the chip music scene at large, and um, I've always appreciated his stuff. Yeah, I do know that name. Uh, I think when I was on Twitter, I definitely followed Jellica. But I think that's something that, yeah, I wanted to talk to you about a little bit. I was sort of mulling over like the, the world of the chip chip tunes and chip tune artists and things. Like it's there's definitely like a punk, there's a punk side to it, isn't yeah. there? In terms of like, you can, you don't need to know like song arrangement or you don't need to know like, um, you can just make music and like oh, yeah. it can be two and a half you know like there there aren't the limitation the limitations of it are um like there aren't the same yeah there aren't the same limitations of it it's quite do you, do you think it's like a punk sort of a has a punk vibe to it yeah f- for sure and i i mean i think that i think that actually it's something you know that uh was a pivotal moment um for eight bit peoples and for the new york chip music scene um, in in general, was um, you know I'm sure you you know the name Bitch Shifter also from the chip music scene. Josh Josh Davis mm-hmm. um, is you know he he and I um, connected very early on in in New York, probably around um, in two, either 2001 or 2002, because he was um, also producing music um, and performing music with the with the Game Boy and LSDJ at the same time as I was just starting out to. Um, and very quickly, we kind of became friends. He became a very important uh, partner. And, you know, we ran 8-Bit Peoples, you know, side by side together for many years. Um, and I think that that punk ethos um, was something that he definitely had in his background. Um, and it brought that kind of like vibe to, uh, to 8-Bit Peoples and to... Um, to the the New York scene as well, and um, I know that you know at, there was um, 
a point at which uh, Malcolm McLaren, you know, uh, became interested in uh, chip music and he ended up, he showed up at one of the shows that we were playing in um, in New York at a place called The Tank, which was like, The Tank is kind of like the CBGBs um, of chip music. Wow. It was like where all of our early shows happened. I mean, if you, anyone you talk to who was into chip music in New York, um, if you, if you mention The Tank, they'll have been to like dozens of shows there. It was, it was kind of the, the epicenter of it. Um, but yeah, there's, I mean, there's definitely that kind of, um, I think like, uh, like both in terms of um the um both in terms of like the rawness of the sound and the like I don't need to know how to I don't need to know music theory to like make music um and like the kind of like attitude I think both uh were something that there was overlap um from uh the the punk and the chip music um scenes mm -hmm. yeah and it has I think it's crossed over in in sort of in bits, I mean, no pun intended. It's it's crossed over yeah. in bits to the mainstream, hasn't it? You know, there have been like there have been big sort of pop tunes that have got chip tune elements. Oh yeah, um, I mean, you hear you hear that kind of sound all the time now. The 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 sort of like raw square wave sound, like leads and and especially like the um, the sort of very fast arpeggios to simulate chords. You hear those kinds of little like details front, and you're like. You're like, I, I, initially, I think when it started making its way in, it was people sampling, actually sampling chip music. And now I think it's almost, uh, it's more like those are just like little aesthetic techniques that have been picked up on and like incorporated into um, into more mainstream um, music and electronic music uh, uh, in general. Mm -hmm. There was one track uh, by Nero, I think. It was, oh, I can't remember mm -hmm. what it's called, but not only was it sort of chip inspired, but the video was basically like an 8-bit or 16-bit video. Oh, game. yeah. I yeah. can't remember what it was called. It's called You and Me, maybe? Was it Nero, You and Me? Like, that was totally... Uh, that was huge. I think... I don't know if it was... Yeah. It was like properly... It was on the TV, and I remember be, like, being at someone's house at a house party... I'm just watching it going, fuck, like the things that I used to like when I was a kid playing video games with no one around. Like this is now like it's like 20 years later and it's just coming to mainstream culture. And I sort of I guess in terms of like the punk element, I remember go going to see DJ Scotch Egg. Oh, Do yeah, you know of course. Him? Yeah, <laughs> yeah J Josh and I Josh and I played a show with him, I think, in Italy at some point. Um, it was uh, the three of us on the bill, um, and yeah, his, his stuff is amazing. <laughs> yeah, wow. I, I love his stuff. Yeah, like breakcore, breakcore with a yeah. megaphone and a microphone. Um, I, I mean, yeah, I have never seen it. I'm, I'd never seen anything like that in my fucking life. <laughs> amazing. <laughs> He's actually using the Game Boy. I think I'd maybe heard yeah, some of yeah, his yeah. tracks online and thought, like, fuck it, you know, like, this is this is yeah. tough. And then, but seeing it live on a PA was just like, oh yeah, wow, the energy this guy is, is my hero. This is disgusting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, are there any sort of? Um, oh, I just yeah, there, there is one crossover track that I would also just like to mention, which yeah. is a track called uh, "Backyard" by a guy called Monty, and it's a house track. Okay. It's like a progressive house track, but it's got the yeah. most beautiful uh, chip tune elements in it. Um, yeah, oh, interesting. I, was, I haven't heard. I haven't heard it. Yeah, I'll I'll, I'll look it up or send me I'll a link. I'll send you I'd a link, man. It, it is. It's one of the. Yeah. It's like really. It's not like um. It's not like a pastiche of chip tune. I think it's really genuinely yeah. a superb element in a really nice track. Um, nice, nice. Yeah, real slow, slow burning track that one. Um, yeah, what sort of artists? would you uh, recommend for people let's say someone who doesn't really know about chiptune are there any like seminal things they need to go to do you think i mean i feel a little uh, i'm at a weird place right now in terms of my knowledge of chip music because i have you know i i was active for a very long time within the chip music scene you know from you know what we've talked about basically from like uh, 99 to 2000, getting into music, 2000, 2001, just starting to get specifically into chip music and then, you know, pretty active, um, continuously from 2001 through 2015. Um, 
And I know a lot of the artists, you know, that were active during that time period, but obviously I, I after 2015, I kind of have drifted away a little bit from the scene uh, and knowing as many of the artists, new artists that are active now. Um, Even and I got into I got into modular synthesis and sort of like expand. I I think I had reached a point where I felt like I had do, done a lot of what I wanted to do with these um, you know chip music platforms and explored a lot of the the technical limitations of them. And I wanted some kind of new challenges. And I think I needed to sort of break out and give myself some of those new challenges and in learning something new and having a new interface in front of me and getting some inspiration from that mm. and. You know, and now I'm at a point where I'm kind of reintegrating the two a bit more. Um, so I have like, you know, a stack of, of modulars over to my right. Um, but then at the very top of it, there's still an NES and a Game Boy sitting on a shelf that are, you know, hooked up to MIDI and can also be sequenced along with all of that stuff. Um, but yeah, but I can talk I can talk a bit about, you know, I mean... A bit shifter is obviously like you know um, someone uh, that it has been a mainstay in the chip music scene, um, doing amazing Game Boy music. Um, Infinity Shred uh, are uh, amazing as well. Um, you know, incorporating live drums and guitars um, alongside um, synthesizers and chip music elements. They started their life as a star, a two piece called Star Scream. Um, which was basically just Game Boy and live drums and then kind of have evolved into this form um, a, of a three-piece that they are now. Um, they're putting out a new album, uh, I think, this this week or next week. Um, and so uh, definitely take a uh, look for Infinity Shred. Um, and Anamataguchi, obviously, you know, one of the acts that came out of the chip music scene that's kind of like blown up um, and become uh, and become pretty big. Um, again, incorporating uh, guitars, drums, bass alongside an NES in their case um, and backing tracks um, sometimes written on, uh, you know, other tracker software. Um, and Chipzell, uh, Chipzell is amazing, uh, Game Boy musician, um, has done a lot of uh, video game soundtrack work at, at, as well now, just um, re- uh, did the soundtrack for a game that just came out called Dicey Dungeons, um, did it, you know, uh, Super Hexagon was, I think, one of her early soundtracks, um, <laughs> and uh, she's just, uh, she's just amazing. But I mean, there's it's there's so many people. It's hard to you know. I could li- I could rattle them off for the next like hour for yeah, you. Yeah, but there's yeah. also like there's also a huge a huge number of new chip music artists that I um you know that only became active sort of after I uh, left the scene and sort of drifted away a little bit. And the thing that's been that's exciting for me right now is kind of like coming back and seeing what's been going on. Um, and trying to uh, reacquaint myself with, um, you know, the people who might still be active from, you know, from the time when I was in the scene and then also seeing all these new names and what they're doing. And there's, uh, you know, there's a lot of great stuff uh, going on. Um, and it's it feels it feels exciting and encouraging because it it, it did feel to me around the time when I kind of drifted away that the scene had got to a point where, um, the sound, you know, there was like almost like a, it had established its own sound and it had become like a genre in which was antithetical to like how I always thought of thought about it and felt about it, which is like, it wasn't a genre chip, chip music and chip tune to me was never like so much a genre it's supposed to be a genre stylistically or st- or aesthetically. It was supposed to be a, it was only a, a genre in a meta sense of like, it was a genre in terms of like the tools we used to produce the music. So like, it's like you, you couldn't call you. No one says like, Oh, guitar music <laughs> as a genre, because like, that's weird because you can make a lot of different types of music with a guitar And that's kind of how I thought of chip music. It was was like, it's kind of weird because it's like referring to the tools and not like really the style of what you're doing with them. Mm, Um, And, uh, but, but the problem was it felt like 
it felt like the sound had kind of like distilled down into like it became all about like how can we make this sound uh you know as little like a Game Boy as possible by pushing the technical limitations and it almost become like became like over um uh I don't know how to explain it it, it became like it's all about the technicality and then you it felt like it lost some of like the heart and the experimentation um and yeah it was all about like producing like big like club banger kind of sound out of a Game Boy which is fucking cool like it I mean it sounds it's amazing when you see someone play something like that out of a Game Boy but like I don't want to like hear track after track like that like all night long at a at a party mm. um or like during a set I want to hear someone making stuff like that with a Game Boy but then I also want to hear someone like trying to make ambient music with a Game Boy or I want to hear someone making like you know power electronics or like drone or noise with like a Game Boy yeah. um, and sort of you know hearing it stretch in all those different directions um, I think is what uh, what was exciting was what was always exciting to me about um, about uh, trip music and um, I think that What's exciting to me now is seeing this new batch of artists that are that are active and some of that experimentation coming back into into the scene. took the question out of my mouth then because as you were talking about it I just started thinking ambient music like are there any ambient Game Boy music makers that would be fucking epic because I think in the last year we've had you know all the all the all the shit we've all been through in the last year worldwide like I've I've fallen in love with ambient music like or it's almost like I, it's almost like I need it now, you know? And uh, yeah, are there other people that do make ambient Game Boy music? I feel like, I, I feel like there are, uh, I can think of examples off the top of my head. It's definitely uncommon, but it's like, I feel like it has been explored. Um, yeah. And I'll try, I'll try and, yeah, I'll try and look up some, uh, some artists. And, you know, the, the problem, the problem is I'm, I, I'm at the point where I've been doing this long enough that I've started to forget a lot of, uh, you know, what I've done and what I've heard. It's displaced and, memories, uh, like that one's yeah. gone now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, so it's it's like, uh, it's it's definitely out there. Um, I mean, it, it not ambient, but sort of like uh, adjacent, ambient adjacent, I, I would say like shoegazy stuff. Um, I can definitely think of off the top of my head, there was... Uh, a group called Tree Wave, um, uh, which was a um, a, a, a two person group um, who did some really amazing shoegazy type stuff, um, and then there's also another uh, band called uh, the Depreciation Guild, um, which was uh, another two piece that also did uh, a, a lot of really interesting shoegazy music. The Depreciation Guild had a, a release on Ape It Peoples. They've also put out. Um, some of their releases uh, solo as well. Wow. Man, I think uh, this has just come to my mind while we've been talking. Like, <clears throat> I love all the names of these chip tunes artists. They all, like, yeah. make me chuckle a little bit, and they're all, like, quite... They're, they're, I don't know, they've just got some magic about all, like, the, the yeah. expression in the name because you can sort of hear their music the moment you say the name. I mean, it would be great to write a book, right, which is just, like, those things. It just says, like, the name of the artist a few lines of, to describe who they were and where yeah. they were from and what yeah. they were about and then, like, their logo or something. That would be such a cool, like, coffee table book of, like, yeah, 20, that's not a bad idea. 20 years of chiptune artists from the yeah, Game Boy. Yeah. Like, you could probably, I don't know, you could tie it into... There's a company called Bitmap Books, for example. They do lots of yeah. books about, like, the Mega Drive or the Snares, Bitmap Brothers, Sensible Soccer, Micro Machines, like, all the classic games. Like, it would be yeah, really yeah, yeah. nice to have a, a book of just, just like what you're saying there, like a two-line synopsis about a duo yep. there from some ends, you know, like, who just... I think that would be a really cool thing, man. 
Yeah. If you want to collaborate, let me know. Yeah. We'll, we'll make a buck. Absolutely, man. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I think that's that's funny. Um, definitely. I think it's a great coffee table reading thing. Yeah. Um, but what you mentioned there sort of reminded me a bit of like what happened to the drum and bass scene. I remember a lot of my friends who are in drum and bass saying that it's got too technical now. Like it's too, Absolutely. it's just about the production now. Like there were so many people that were just really hacked off that like the the soul had just fallen out of it. And it was just like oh, wow, how has he done that? You know, it's just people chin-stroking music rather than, yeah. Yeah, I, th- I mean, I actually, I think it's uh, it's very similar to what happened in the, in the jungle and drum and bass scene where there used to be a lot of different sort of like uh, variations of the genre and different approaches to it. Um, and you had stuff that was more vocal oriented, stuff that was, you know, uh, more instrumental and... and um, more some stuff that was more about sound design some stuff that was more about the technical side and then it became uh more and more about um yeah that sort of like hyper technicality and also that like uh, i think exactly the same thing i'm talking about which is like a big bass drop you know that became like the the track that the you know the jungle or the drum and bass track that you would drop that would like get the dance floor like going crazy but then like because of that once like once you have one track after another like that then it loses its power because those tracks are only only have that reaction because you drop them in the set of a lot of other types of jungle and drum and bass Ooh, yeah. and once you have one of those you know back to back with another for an entire night it just becomes tiring and it becomes like you know it doesn't have the same impact as it does when you when you have it mixed in with other things absolutely absolutely yeah it doesn't you just you lose that impact um there's no like yeah you, yeah you don't have the dynamics i remember listening i was listening not long ago i was listening to to a drum and bass set and it was quite a modern one and i just sent a text message to my friend and just said some of these tracks are just making me laugh like I'm just laughing yeah. when they drop and I don't know why yeah. it's like it, like that's my response to it I'm just laughing yeah. like it's I never had it it just sounded it did sound like s- silly you know it sounded silly yeah. and like maybe on a PA and on a club you really feel it and um obviously the vibes a bit different but um yeah, I remember like having this really weird reaction of laughing <laughs> to all these drops. It was weird. Yeah. I mean, it but but that all that being said, I think that there I think that uh I feel like for the last few years the uh jungle drum and bass is kind of having an interesting resurgence and there's I think some really I- cool and interesting new stuff coming out of that scene. Um I mean, I've been really into um the stuff Pete Cannon is doing uh yeah, you know yeah. with on the Amigas uh you know producing um jungle and drum and bass tracks that are really really great have like that old school feeling to them but he's bringing something new to them as well and um a friend of mine um also from the trip music scene my friend Akira who uh, used to produce under the name HGB uh turned me on to uh, Tim Reaper um, and his stuff and, uh, I've been enjoying checking that out, but yeah, I feel like, I, I, I feel like that stuff is, 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 it's, it's been on its way back for a while and I feel like, um, yeah, it's still, it's still coming, coming back and it's going to continue getting bigger. Mm. Yeah. You, you, and, and that, to it's, go on. It still it still feels like I and I think that you alluded to this earlier saying like that, you know, stuff with breaks like feels like futuristic still. And I I feel like that it uh, I, I feel the same about it. I feel like that kind of like jungle and drum and bass like still feels like some of the most futuristic music like that I can imagine. And um, yeah, the and atmosphere there's some of those something, jungle tracks. It's like, you, yeah, you just get tingles some, even now. There's something about it. Um. Exactly, exactly. But yeah, it's right to point out that, uh, yeah, there are definitely also artists making fantastic drum and bass and pushing the boundaries and not following the herd, um, for sure. Yeah, and Pete Cannon is absolutely amazing. And what I, what I also like about Pete Cannon is he's very, he's very candid in, in his process. Yeah. Like, he just, like, he'll show you exactly what he's doing. He's sort of like, I've got this Amiga 500, and it's hooked up to this MIDI sequencer, and it's going over to yeah. this desk. Like, he literally just shows it. And um, I think that's really nice for, for people who are making music who've never seen all that stuff before. And, like, going, oh, wow, totally, yeah. listen to what he's making on that weird and, computer. And I think, yeah, 
And I think that the cool, I think that the cool thing about that and what, what that speaks to, and there's, and again, there's overlaps between that and the chip music scene is, uh, if you don't, if you don't have to be mysterious about the hardware, then it means that you have confidence in the music you're producing with it. Right. It's like, you know, what's, what's the secret? You t- get the stuff, get the same exact setup and see what you can do with it. It's not about like having a secret hardware setup that makes the sound. It's like, it's about how far you can push that setup with, you know, what you know and what your creative vision is and what your approach to it is. And I think that mm. that's something that you also um, saw in the chip music scene a lot is like a very uh, high degree of openness about like, this is, this is what we use. There's like, I mean, on, you know, my website right now is a very uh, stripped down version of what it used to be. Um, there's just a bunch of countdown, countdown timers yeah, on yeah. my website <laughs> website now. It looks cool. Though. But, it looks um, like, yeah, it looks like super dystopian. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that, yeah, that's pretty much the vibe to fit the times, right? Um, but it, uh, you know, it used to be, if you go to the, the Internet Archive Wayback Machine, there's... Um, there's uh, archived versions of my site on there oh, cool. and uh, al- alongside, um, you know, the Game Boy tracks and the NES tracks and things like that that were on there. Um, you know, there were also tutorials that I wrote for this is how you write NES music. This is how you put NES music on to a cartridge and play it on, really? uh, you know, uh, on the actual hardware. This is. You know, I wrote um, one of the first sort of tutorials and guides to using LSDJ when it when it first came out. And, you know, there is there's an LSDJ manual, but you could read the manual and learn all the intricacies of it. But also the the sort of like, oh, there you go. Yeah, yeah. Maybe you wrote this. Yeah. <laughs> is this what you wrote? No, no. I think I think you have the I think you have the official manual. But yeah, it says the, 2007. Um, yeah, that one's Johan's official LSDJ manual, but the one that I had was kind of like here's <laughs> yeah. the one the one I the one I wrote was just kind of like a here's like a step by step process of how to write like your first beat on LSDJ. Like enter these notes at these places and like you'll get this sound and so it was really uh fo- it was like focused towards like people who had like never picked up a a tracker before and like didn't know what was going on and like the manual might have been overwhelming and so it was like here's how you write game boy music like here's how you get a sound to come out of this game boy and then like you can build from that point definitely Um, great resource really great resource i'm sure i read your i'm sure i read your instructions back in the day when you know when that website was actually live and doing its thing yeah you did read something really interesting in 2018 um I I was on Twitter then and I do remember sort of watching it sort of pan out so you you release a new song every week yeah. for the whole year. Yeah, what what was that? Why did you do that and what was that like? What how how did that go? Yeah, so that was um that was the kind of impetus behind that was uh I hadn't really I hadn't really been disciplined about like producing new stuff um, in, the, in the years leading up to that. And I wanted to kind of get back into, you know, working those creative muscles again. Um, and the uh, the sort of thing that catalyzed uh, me into doing that was there's a, uh, a website called uh, Weekly Beats, um, where basically, you know, at the beginning of the year, a bunch of people just sign up and they say, all right, I'm going to try and make a song every week for the the entire year. And, um, and you essentially have, uh, you know, you have up until, I think it's like, I don't remember if it's Saturday or I think it was Sunday night, um, you know, at a certain time you had, uh, you could upload a track up until that deadline. And then like after that, like you'd lost the ability to upload a track for that week. Um, mm. And so it really, it basically motivates you to like, you there's like an, a deadline that exists outside of your control. And like, if you get something uploaded within that time, then you get, you have a song for that week. And if you miss the deadline by 10 seconds, then that's it. You missed, missed that week. And so it kind of forces you to, to say like, all right, I'm not going to be precious about it. I'm not going to like try and write the perfect track. I'm just going to try and write something this week. And um, yeah, that the experience of participating in that project uh, was 
I mean, it was hard. It was definitely like, uh, there were times when I was like stressed out and, you know, I was like, fuck, what am I going to write? You know, this week I'm, I'm getting, I, I don't know, I'm getting bored. I feel like I'm writing the same stuff over and over. And so you kind of had to push yourself creatively to like explore new sounds, um, explore new approaches. And then also, uh, just, um, yeah, just kind of like, uh, change your approach to music in terms of like thinking about what a track could be like it doesn't have to be like a you know a perfectly composed like start here and like end here and go through all these different movements um it could be something that's like an ambient track I, I did you know one of the tracks that I did was kind of like an ambient drone noise track that I wrote with an ARP 2600 um and you know that was just uh-huh. like a matter of like, I sat down that week and I like sat down in front of an ARP for you know, an hour and made a bunch of textures. And then I recorded that hour and then I edited it down into like, you know, a five or six minute track and, um, and put that out as that week's piece. But it was funny because at the beginning of the year, I would basically like start a track at the beginning, beginning of the week, work on it for hours every night all through the week and then and then have the track done at the at the at the end of the week and be like okay but like still feel like I needed more time you know still feel like that was rushed and then the the you know the further on the year went like I would wake up like on Sunday morning and I would be like all right time to make a track and I would just you know you know start writing something and be like okay two hours later I got a track all right record it like send it out and you know, the thing I think that was, uh, that was interesting and that I learned through that process was that like the time spent on a track didn't necessarily correlate to like how good I thought the track was. And like, I was able to write some really great tracks in a few hours. Um, and, uh, some of the tracks that I spent like days and, you know, hours each day on, uh, I don't think were as good as the ones where I was like, here's an idea, like get it down, get it out. Like that's, you know, it's almost like it forces you to distill a track down to like the core idea and like not polish away all the like little rough edges that give it the character. And then because of that, it's like, it's more, it's a better track in the end. Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah, it would like change your your relationship with the process of making music, having that having that limitation of time. Um, yeah, and I guess also like people talk a, a lot about the being in a creative zone yeah. or whatever. And if you're basically forcing yourself to be in a creative zone, I I would say that going into that place after having done that sort of thing is a night. You know, yeah, it's like you're able that that place is a bit more malleable than yeah, it used to be totally. like you don't have to have optimal surroundings to be right. in that creative zone like you could you could do it in five minutes yeah pressure yeah if you needed and to. i mean there there were times when um you know uh during that during that year you know my my girlfriend and partner like uh, you know i have to definitely thank her for being so supportive throughout that year because like you know, I was, like I said, in the beginning, I was spending a ton of time working on music and it was just kind of like, you know, the weekend would come and she'd be like, Hey, do you want to go out and do something? And I'd be like, I have to work on music. Like I have to get a track done. And I feel like, I feel like really bad because I feel like that was like, you know, I wasn't like around at mu- as much like an accessible to like actually interact with, be- especially early in that year because of that. Um, but as the year went on, it was you know, I was like, this is, I was like, this is crazy. Like you need to find like a better, like way of like balancing like your music work and your life. And, uh, and then I remember, yeah, there were times when, you know, we went on vacation and I still had to make a track. And so I would bring like, you know, one of the teenage operators, like pocket, uh, pocket operators, like drum, you know, the PO 12 drum machine. And I, You know, we'd be driving to wherever we're, you know, going upstate to like, uh, you know, a national park or something. And I would be in the car, you know, in the passenger seat writing like a little drum beat and like trying to get something done and then recording it, 
you know, into the H4N and, and then, you know, uploading the MP3 from my phone. Um, and so, uh, and then, yeah, there was another time uh, I was uh, on a camping trip with a bunch of friends. We were camping out, doing like some canoe camping out on a lake. Um, oh, nice. And I, you know, I, had, I hadn't written a track yet for that week. My plan leading up to it was like, I'll get the track done before we leave on the camping trip. I'll upload it. I won't have to worry about writing music, you know, while I'm out camping. Didn't get around to doing it, obviously. And so I was like, okay, I'll bring my phone. I have Nanoloop on my phone. I'll write a Nanoloop track. Um, and I'll just, I'll, that's how I'll do this week's track. And uh, yeah, ended up uh, dropping four tabs of acid on that, uh, <laughs> on that camping trip. Uh, having a full on ego death experience, like re assimilating Whoa. my re assimilating my understanding of like reality and consciousness into my body, and then uh, and then that night, uh, like basically was up all night writing a nano loop track, and then like uploaded it in the morning, and that was like my track for that week. So. So it became much more of a, of a, wow. you know, something that was like, you know, I was like, I have to put aside everything else in my life t- in order to make these tracks each week. And then it became very much like a, how do I just like integrate making music into my life in a way where it's like, it can fit in between anything that I'm doing. And I can just like, yeah, like not be as precious with it and just be like, this is just another thing that you do is like write, write music. Yeah, I think when you when you think in those terms of like it being a disposable thing that I've just quickly got to do. Yeah. There's a lot of pressure that you take off yourself um in uh, certainly we all put a lot of pressure on ourselves I think yep. making music and we have ridiculously high expectations oh, yeah. that are like basically unattainable. But yeah, having something where it is just disposable that like oh, I've quickly got to do this. Um, it totally makes sense what you're saying that you actually t- turned out that you make great stuff yeah. in a really short and, period of time. And I think that like that, uh, I think that like that approach of like thinking about it as like the, the even if you're thinking about it in a in a sort of like disposable approach, that doesn't necessarily mean that that's like the outcome of it, right? It's like that. It's Absolutely. it's like yeah, you're yeah, just yeah. like you're freeing up yourself from like expectations, but in that process you're actually maybe giving yourself um, permission to like be more experimental and free and like expressing yourself and then potentially leading to better outcomes than like you uh, would have gotten if you had all of that pressure that you were holding, you know, on your shoulders. And I think that that kind of goes hand in hand with like this, you know, the phrase like that um, has kind of been my mantra for like this year. I was like, uh, the perfect, the perfect is the enemy of the good, right? It's like, if you, if you're always trying to aim for something perfect, like you're not, ne- you're like, sometimes you never even get anything out. Like, and I think that that's like been a problem for me in the past is like, um, having, having a sense of like, I need to like, you know, especially for things like, you know, I, I, you know, I'm in terms of a musician, I'm, I feel like I'm more, um, of a perfor- performance oriented musician than like a re- recording like studio mu- musician. And so for me, it's the, the, my interest in music is really about like writing music and playing it in front of people and, you know, having that kind of two way communication that happens during a show when like there's someone on stage playing and then you're seeing the energy and the reaction from the crowd and you're able to like respond to that in, in, in a feedback loop. And um, I think that for me, it's always been hard to uh, approach recording material because you lose that and you're kind of like you're taking this like um, piece of music and you're kind of like freezing it in like a single state. Like it becomes like the version of the song that everyone knows and you're putting it out there. And so because of that, I'm like, but it has to then it has to be the perfect version. Like it has to be exactly how I want it and I because I can't ever change it after I record it and put it out there um and so I think it sort of goes under the microscope yeah and it's like in that process yeah and so it it become and I think that that can be a little bit paralyzing if you think of it that way 
Um, and so I, I think I've started trying to think about um, recording differently and just thinking about like it as, um, you know, it's not uh, to me like my rec the recorded versions of my tracks aren't like definitive versions. They're like snapshots of like this is what this song could sound like. Like when you hear it live, when I play it live, it might sound totally different. It might sound like this. It might sound like something else. And I think that just that little change in how I uh, approach thinking about it had, has made it easier to sort of um, record and, and release material. Definitely, man, definitely. Um, I think, um, for example, seeing artists like the Chemical Brothers live is exactly like you're saying there. You yeah. know, they have these definitive album versions, but when you see them live, you can hear the bass line of a track that you know is totally. coming in and you're like, that's a, what is it? It's totally different. Or they have these extended cuts of their, of their tracks. And um, yeah, I think it's, you know, tremendous that you do have that approach of being, of like, yeah, of being a performative thing that you, that you sort of have the two way back and forward with audiences. Yeah. 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 That's, um, that's cool, man. Yeah. I, I, for me personally, is I'm just like I find my sweet spot is uh, improv. Oh yeah, just improving yeah. completely, with no plan. Yeah. For some reason, that's where I just love being on that knife edge of this could sound <laughs> fucking terrible, and then it does sound terrible, but then you pull it back, yeah. and it's the, like the most yeah, yeah. amazing thing. I, right, yeah, yeah I love that. <laughs> that's actually it makes me uh, yeah that actually that makes me think of. Um, I'm not, I wouldn't say that I uh, thrive under a, uh, like a full, full on improv situation. I feel like that's definitely like outside of my comfort zone. I like, I think what I would say I like to approach live performance as is like a live remix of a track. And so like, I like to have, mm -hmm. I like to have the structure of the track, the heart of the track, everything sequenced out and, and know that like I can, um, I can kind of guide the, like, you know, how long I spend on, uh, each, you know, part and moving from moving one part to the, uh, to the other in the track and which parts of, um, the arrangement I bring in or out at different times. And then how I change the actual synthesized sounds like in real time. Um, and that kind of is like my, my sweet spot, but I will say I, recently played on um i played like a live stream show uh, a little while back um for uh this um uh i guess collective called does it bang um that's uh or organized by this guy nick drexler and um and uh, uh lucy stoner are kind of like the two the two main people of running does it bang and they're awesome they put on really cool parties um and like online like online parties and live streams and uh it was it was great having that opportunity to to sort of be a part of that and um but the thing was i hadn't it was i hadn't played like a live stream show you know this is obviously because of like everyone is doing live streams live stream shows now for the past year because we've all been living in this weird world um but i hadn't done one and so i was like all right, I have to make this look cool. I have to make it sound good. I don't know what I'm going to play. I had, I had been, so I'm like working on, um, I had like a really, also at the same time, I had a really big project going on at work that I was like spending a lot of time on as well. That was also around live streaming, but I was like, it was more on the technical side of like figuring out a live stream setup. And so I was like, okay, this will help. I can like figure out all the technicalities of like the live stream setup from like the AV perspective, and then that'll inform like how I approach the live um, stream performance. Um, but because of that, I like hadn't had the opportunity to like spend as much time on the music that I was gonna play as I wanted. And so mm -hmm. I had like six tracks that were like, you know, beginnings of tracks that like didn't really, like they started and they like progressed to a middle point and then they didn't really have any way of like ending. And yeah, so, it's like a big question mark. Yeah, and so I was like, and I never, and then that's where I ended up, like on the day of the performance, and I was like, oh fuck, I was like, all right, so this is go this is gonna look really good. It's there's not gonna be any pro technical problems with like the stream dropping out or like cameras being going black or anything. 
Um, I had like uh, three, ca like a multi camera setup that I was like switching between three different angles, like during the performance. I had visuals streaming in and like getting chroma keyed and overlaid over like the performance from like another laptop that was running. Um, like what's essentially like a standalone version of the of milk of like the Winamp visualizer milk drop and so i had yeah there was a really good one of them yeah, yeah. and oh, so i had one called g-force did you ever use the one called g-force i think i i think i remember that oh, one too it was amazing yeah it was, i had a friend who had a flashback while we were while one day <laughs> he's like oh my god i'm straight he's like took acid years ago he's like oh my god it's too much <laughs> it's i mean that that, good. it's like tripping isn't that it? sounds amazing. that sounds right um, but yeah, I, so I had all this, I had this like crazy, this crazy setup, like in terms of the AV setup. And then I had like this very, like what to me felt like extremely half to bake, uh, musical setup ready. And I was like, fuck, I just, I'm just going to have to figure this out and do this. And, um, and, uh, ended up like having a super fun time, like doing the performance and like, you know, could see we, it was streamed on Twitch. And so you could see the people in the chat, um, alongside the performance and reacting. Nice. And that was kind of cool because I was like, Oh, I didn't really think about this. That like, even though it's a live stream performance, I'm still getting a little bit of that, like two way communication feeling that I, I have from like being in front of a, a live, a live audience when you're playing. And yeah, I had a great time. I was like, also had recently got um, uh, a, a Re 303, the the TB 303 um, clone, and I was like, wow, it's actually amazing how far just an acid baseline will take will take a set, and you you know you just have that acid baseline running and just continue tweaking that filter and resonance and. And then, you know, playing around with like which beats are coming in and you can you can really stretch an acid bass line a long way. <laughs> Yeah, I saw I saw on your social media feed you had a thing that said like this is a TB three oh three now, do you feel old oh, yeah. sort of meme thing? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was like, Wow, what's that thing? I need to fucking check that out. That looks fucking cool. Yeah, like a mini T B three oh three. I will just say at this juncture I I need to commend you on taking four tabs of acid <laughs> and then being able to write a track yeah. <laughs> after doing that. Well it was uh, I mean yeah, it's I I think that uh as one would expect under those circumstances, like when I finished, like when I finished the track, I was like, fuck, this is fucking incredible. And then, you know, like two days later, I listened to it and I was like, all right, this is a little bit crazy, but it's, yeah, it's got something to it. Uh, but yeah, I, I mean, it, it, it felt, uh, it felt amazing to be writing it while still sort of coming down off of that. And, um, cause you, you, I felt like I was, in the middle of this like sound space it was it's a very drony like very like um oversaturated distorted kind of like track and it felt uh very like enveloping when i was working on it um but yeah it was uh yeah you know you got to do what you got to do get that get that track done yeah, which which track is it? By the way, do you know which one it is? It's so it's um it's not up on my SoundCloud. It was so uh so I should say that 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 project with working on a track every week, you um you would essentially like have to like I talked about you'd have to upload the track by the deadline on uh, on you know Sunday evening or something, and then it would go on to the site the weekly beats site and then alongside that I was basically taking those tracks and then I was like uploading them to my SoundCloud but halfway or not halfway a little more than halfway through I stopped uploading them to my SoundCloud because I was like I just need to focus on like getting them done and getting them done and and I I had kind of taken on a little bit too much when um I started uploading them to SoundCloud because I was like oh, if I'm putting them on SoundCloud, they need like an image alongside them. And so then I was like making an album cover every week in addition to like a track every week. And I was like doing, like if you look on the SoundCloud, like there, it's a bunch of like 
3D models. And so I was basically like doing a bunch of like 3D modeling and like um, sculpting and things like that and coloring to like get these tracks uh and get these tracks to have like associated album covers and at some point like halfway through the year I was just like fuck this is so much work I'm like I'm like it, it became the the kind of thing where like I could write a write a track more quickly but then I was like spending a lot of time working on album art for it yeah and right. so I had like filled up the time that I had like reclaimed from the music <laughs> for my life to like now it's filled up by like graphic design um and so that that track and like a bunch of the others like that happened later in the year um, live on like the weekly beats site, but they're not up on my SoundCloud. But that's also something a lot of those tracks I'm um, I'm planning to revisit um, this year and sort of uh, do a little bit of extra production on and um, start putting them out on, on on some actual proper releases. Yeah, it'd be, it'd be really, really interesting to hear it. I, just, I get the image of like myself or, you know, just somebody spending like five minutes on a track, two hours on the artwork, and then about six hours trying to think of a good name for oh, it. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> you know? And of course, the name, the name, the name, the name of also, yeah, naming tracks is always like a big thing for me because I feel like it's such a... Um, it you know it's the it's the first it's like the context that someone enters into listening to that that piece of music with and like yeah you could you can entirely change someone's perception of a piece of music depending on like what you title it you know it could be you could be Definitely. kind of like very serious very like uh, cerebral or you could be very kind of like um, offhanded and co uh, kind of almost jokey with it and I think that kind of it's like titling a piece of art right it's like that you know it, it entirely informs your experience of how you read that piece of art yeah like you say it is like the first point that you you encounter the artwork I did see something quite funny the other day where someone had they'd rewritten Orteca track titles with the titles they think that they you know should have had <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Instead of being just like a load of fucking yeah, digits, yeah, yeah. they'd called it like the Hamilton Warehouse Module <laughs> Four or something. You know, they just they called it what they what they what what they interpreted its name yeah, yeah, should have yeah. been because like they that. can't remember these ridiculous um, song titles. Cool man. Well, yeah. Um, I guess it's it would be important. You've just you've just done a release um, these last few days, haven't you? Yeah, yeah. I put out. I just put out a release last week. Um, it's a four track four track Game Boy EP um, called Chasm, um, and uh, yeah, it's it's essentially um, material Game Boy material that I um, wrote. Uh, I think the tracks on this release were written between sometime between 2007 and 2011. Um, and then, you know, I, there's a, a lot of Game Boy material that I had sort of written and performed for many years and never actually recorded and released. And so I have made a conscious effort, um, you know, this year to, to begin recording and, and putting that stuff out. And so this is the first in a series of uh, what will be um, at least four EPs um, that I'll be releasing over the next um, few months. Um, and if you want to know when they're coming out, um, you can hit up nullsleep.com. There's countdown timers showing, uh, you know, when each of those releases is coming out. Um, and I'm putting them all out on, uh, on Bandcamp. Um, so, yeah, it feels good to, to get this first one out for sure. Hmm. And what was it that brought those those four tracks together uh were they all made at the same time what was it that made you yeah it was so so i um so how i approached it was basically i uh i have i mean the people listening to this won't be able to see but i'll show you that i have what's essentially like a stack of a bunch of game boy cards i mean i have like probably like um uh, maybe 20 Game Boy carts on my desk right now. Wow, and nice. th and they're just, they're, yeah, they're, they're all copies of LSDJ with different songs that I wrote over the years on them um, and performed with. And what I did is I, I you know, uh, uh, about um, 
actually. I, so I, something you're, you're going to notice is I'm kind of obsessed with time. I'm like the progression of time. Um, mm-hmm. And so I'm looking over to my right and I can tell you that, um, you know, I, I lived in New York for uh, about 20 years. Um, and uh, when when my girlfriend and I left, um, we started a timer for how long it's been since we left New York. So it's been 559 days, 18 hours, uh, 26 minutes and 55 seconds since I left New York. Um, and, uh, and so, so having, having left New York, um, you know, part of the, part of the reason for that was, there's a lot of reasons for that, but part of the reason was having a bit more, um, space and time to kind of be creative, um, not being, um, you know, not having to, uh, have the, the sort of like, I I think that the city just started beginning to feel oppressive after a certain amount of time, like being there so long, it was like, both of us say like, you know, we loved New York until we like one day woke up and we just hated it. It It's like a very like, you know, hitting a wall and you're like, okay, this is, I'm done. Like that's, that's it. Um, and you know, there's still things I love, I love about the city. I, I look forward to going and visiting and like, I miss my friends there and, and everything. But like now we're, you know, we're living out in the Southwest. We're here in Tucson, Arizona. We, we basically traveled around for the better part of a year, staying in New Mexico and Arizona in uh, California. And basically we're just um, moving around with everything we owned fitting into like the back of our, of our car, uh, nice. and, uh, ended up here, you know, when COVID happened and, you know, that's why we've been sort of like stationed in one place ever since. Um, but, but it was, yeah, I think that the, you know, what led to this moment and sort of like taking this opportunity to, um, to start to start recording these these things is that you know there's a long time has passed there is like some things that happened in my life that were like very uh traumatic along the way um in, you know between the time I wrote these um wrote these songs and and now and uh you know I was in a very um you know dark place at some points very depressed like suicidal for years and uh I think it was hard for me to uh, revisit, um, some of these pieces of music because of those associations. Um, and, you know, over the last few years, uh, I, I've been able to like do a lot of, uh, healing and, um, and sort of being able to like, um, move forward, um, in a healthy way. Uh, and, uh, because of that, I felt like, uh, you know, I was ready to, to sort of get, get these out again and pull them out of the, the archives. And, um, and so the thing that led to these four tracks being put together is essentially, I just went through every, every cartridge in the archives that I had. And I, um, you know, I, as you saw, I have them marked with post-it. So I went through and looked what was on each cartridge, marked down the ones where there were tracks that I thought were like finished versions that I wanted to record. And then I essentially uh, recorded every every one of the tracks that I wanted to multi-tracked them out. So each channel of each track is recorded separately. Um, and uh, and then once I had all of the like all of the tracks recorded, um, which is ended up being like sixteen or seventeen tracks total, I just started. Um, trying to listen through them and figuring out which ones felt like they told a story when grouped together. And so these four tracks, um, Chasm, uh, uh, Disaster Fetish, Shadows in the Sky, and The Other Self, it felt like they formed a narrative arc um, for me. Um, and they, uh, yeah, they sort of like make up what uh, feels like the first, the first entry point into this like EP series. Yeah, going back through those archives and going back through those old tracks, um, it's it's like a wonderful experience. But yeah, I guess 
you know, I've also had very dark times in my life, traumatic times. So yeah. I can I can relate completely to going back to tracks made at that time and sort of it bringing back a lot of emotion, a lot of memories. Because I think that's what music does, isn't it? It's like oh yeah, it's, it's really, a time machine. Yeah, it's like it's much higher. It's a much higher resolution than, than than we can see. I think we can hear over yeah. like ten octaves, but we can see over two octaves. So yeah. the depth of emotion with music is huge. So um, yeah, I think that's that's really you know it's a commendable thing for you to to go back through those things and find, you know the 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 love and 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 yeah cherish those things that you created then um, yeah. yeah and sort of slightly retouch them and bring them bring them bring them back to life, man. Um, yeah, it feel, it feel, I mean, it was, it's, you know, it's been a challenging, a challenging experience, but it's also felt like, um, you know, obviously very re- rewarding to, to, to finally be like, this stuff is out in the world now. Like I, it's not like going to be lost, you know, in, in time. It's like the, these are, these are songs that I've played live, you know, many times and in, in front of people and, there are people that, you know, over the years have been still asking, like, when are you going to release Shadows in the Sky? When are you going to release, you know, these tracks? And um, and so it feels good to, like, have them out there and to know that, like, you know, with these they mean they mean one thing to me, but like they also mean something different to every other person who heard them at all these different performances. And those people have their own associations with the songs and like they you know, those memories might be good for, good for them. And like, you know, or maybe there's hard memories for them too, but like they're, it's cool to have, um, the ability to like give them something that then can allow them to also revisit those times in their lives and, um, and sort of, uh, yeah, connect, connect again. Yeah. 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 Well, um, it sounds great, man. I really, I've been blasting it out the last few days. It sounds really, really good. Um, I love the artwork too. The artwork's absolutely fantastic. Um, Thank you. Looks beautiful. Um, yeah, I always think that's really weird when people interview artists and they say like, or or, or, or like the desire people have to know what a song is about. You know, like the artist yeah. written a song. Like, what was it about? What's the meaning behind that song? Because. I don't know. From my point of view, that's fairly irrelevant. All all that matters is what does it mean to you? Like, yeah. What do you? What does it mean to you? That's that's the thing that yeah. It's sort of interesting that people have this desire to really know what a song meant to the artist. Like, what were they? Yeah, and it's. Put? I mean, yeah. I feel the same. I'm like, I, I don't know. Also, I don't know the answer to that question half the time. Like my, exactly. you know, yeah, when, I, when I, you, appre- you know, it's very subconscious for me, like what, what a song means. It's like, I know that, uh, you know, it was, it's music for me is like, I don't, I, and I was just talking about this earlier today with like a friend, like I don't, um, I don't sit down like to write a song and go like, I'm going to write this kind of song or I'm going to write like a song that's happy or upbeat, or I'm going to write a sad song. I just start writing music and what comes out comes out. And then I like have to live with that. And, (laughs) you know, that's kind of like, that's the song. Um, And so I feel like it's, you know, for me, music is kind of like, um, just like a emotional snapshot of like where I'm at in that moment. And like a lot of it for me is also, um, you know, I think that subconsciously as, as a track starts to take shape, you know, I can, I can start picking up on maybe what the vibe of the song is and then accentuating it and emphasizing it a little bit. And, um, I do like to think about, um, songs as like, um, a form of like world building almost like, you know, creating like an, uh, like a, a space that, um, people are brought into and like creates some kind of like, not just like a, an emotional feeling, but also like maybe creates some kind of like imaginary, like vision of like what this, you know, song looks like to them. Um, and, and, but I'm, yeah, I, I think I agree with you. I'm always more interested in hearing what that place is that it brings people and, or hearing where, where that, what that emotional feeling it is, uh, is that uh, it brings to people more than like telling them, you know, this is what, this is what I saw when I wrote it, or this is what I, uh, felt when I wrote it. It, And because then it's interesting if you 
have you know someone share what they saw or what they felt and it, it is the same as what you felt or what you saw and you're like wow okay we're connecting on this because like that was that's really coming through in the communication but i think it's also really interesting when you hear a very different interpretation of it and you um you know you can really appreciate um the nature of like um of abstraction and how like we as like humans like put our own meaning onto things that like have you know we we find a pattern in it we find meaning in it and you know that applies not just to music but like everything in life you know we like we create meaning around us you know we create narratives about like what our lives are and what our lives mean and um you know i i kind of of the am of the opinion that that's like the only meaning in the universe like is the stuff that we create we make up but there's like not really any meaning beyond that um but maybe that's i that's good enough i mean you know we're we're weird we're a weird biological anomaly that you know a bunch of a bunch of you know atomic particles and molecules bumped around into each other for you know a long time and eventually like life emerged and then eventually like intelligent life emerged and then you know we have been either blessed or cursed with like consciousness and like awareness of a self um which is like also just like a construct like i don't really believe that there's like an inherent self like we we just like have developed that as like an evolutionary probably survival skill of like there's me and everything else and i need to protect the me part but like really what separates you from everything else except for that idea um and and yeah i don't know there's like it's it's just nice to to be alive and and to just enjoy the weird hallucination that being alive is maybe <laughs> and maybe that's enough definitely man yeah i mean there's there's times when it feels like a dream state and you know and it feels like yeah. this this sort of um yeah magical magical place that's not all that it seems um definitely yeah definitely i think um yeah like we are like one everything is like connected we are all this 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 big collective force together so yeah seeing those differences is like um it's pretty semantic really yeah and i and i and i think that that's one of the things i love about music and is that like shared experience of music and how it does make you feel like connected to other people um and it breaks it breaks down a little bit of that like you know like as as corny as like some of like the old school like you know rave like plur vibes were like that was all that's also really beautiful it's like you know that's there's something really nice about those sentiments of like you know unity and you know love uh among people and like it's uh you know as much as you could like make fun of it as you know you know of, of course it's because like people were on drugs but like yeah, I, I, it's not something that we shouldn't aspire to regardless like we're all you know like the it, it just makes looking at the kind of things that are going on in the world so ridiculous you're like people fighting over like the stupidest things like all this bullshit drama that like happens people like you know um just like all of the the violence between different groups of people and you're like like why you, you all of these all of these distinctions between people are made up things we've just created them in our heads we don't have to like the only universal is like we're all here and conscious of the fact that we're here we're floating on a big fucking rock in the middle of like an endless universe <laughs> and like we have to make up things to like fight with each other like just like let everyone live their lives, live your own life. Like don't cause any harm to anyone else. Like if you can make their lives better, like it doesn't seem that hard. Like definitely if we were and if we were all doing that, we'd all live better lives. Yeah. Like we'd all elevate up together as yeah. one. Yeah, man. Absolutely. Yeah. I totally agree with you, man. Um, I think that's a good note to end on. Unity of planet Earth. <laughs> yeah, plur. There you go. That's the 
that's the ending note for the for this uh, interview. I'm I'm down. Yeah, man. Well, um, yeah, it's been fantastic to speak to you, man. I really, um, really appreciate talking to you. Really appreciate your time. Yeah, thanks a lot. I, I, I had a great time talking with you. Yeah, and yeah, you've been a seminal chiptune artist uh, that I know has been in my consciousness for a long, long time and a lot of other people. So um, thanks for all the all the stuff you've contributed to that. Absolutely. I'm, I mean, I'm looking forward to, to putting out, uh, you know, the rest of this material and then um, some new stuff after that. Excellent. And possibly a book for the coffee table in yeah, the years we'll, to we'll come. Yeah, we'll see. We'll, we'll, yeah, let's, let's email. We'll talk about this coffee table book. We'll see what happens. Nice, man. Cool. Well, thank you very much for speaking to me. All right. Thanks. I'll talk to you soon. Oh, what a great guy. Um, really, really enjoyed speaking to Noel Sleep. Um, the list of artists that he spoke about in the beginning of the episode is essentially the artist that I grew up listening to and that were my all-time favourite artists. So um, that was an amazing thing. Um, yeah, he's really been a driving force in the chip tune scene for a long time and it's great to see him releasing new material. So do go on Bandcamp and check out his website um, and support his amazing music. Okay, next time we're speaking to a singer-songwriter um, who is an amazing, amazing artist. She writes really wonderful pop songs and um, also makes really great videos too. Um, we have a, a, a discussion about, about life and about um, lots of things aside from music, which is very interesting. Please check out the Ko-Fi page and support the podcast if you can. It'd be greatly appreciated. Uh, I'm Lydia and I'll see you again soon.